Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our quarterly assembly. Before we begin, as we always do, we want to do an acknowledgement that the land that we are on are the land of uh, the indigenous peoples who, who were on these lands well long before many of us were here. We want to acknowledge their presence. We want to acknowledge their history. We want to acknowledge um, the fact that we are on land that was held by indigenous folks of Northeastern Ohio. And we thank you all for acknowledging them with us. Secondly, uh, for purposes of access to all folks, this event will be recorded and we do have live transcriptions and I'll ask staff, they can let you know how you can enable those or they are enabled on, on the transcription. If you send a chat to um, myself or to Valerie, uh, who is assisting us or to Meg, Valerie Schumacher or Meg Mako, we can assist you on access. Also at the top of the morning, I just wanna, we always like to do a reminder about what is Assembly for the Arts. We are the host for this meeting and how we are configured. Assembly for the Arts is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. We have a board of directors, 27 board members. Um, we are also affiliated uh, uh, with our own action committee called Assembly for Action. Um, and I, Jeremy Johnson, president and CEO, am, am, am the head of both of those organizations. The important part of this chart that you see is that not only are we a nonprofit, but we are very closely in alignment with a government agency. We are not a government agency, but we are very closely aligned with one of the most important, one of the most important government agencies that does public funding of the arts in Northeastern Ohio. And of course, that agency is Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. Board members on, of CAC are on our board. And we are also regular part of CAC's uh, board convenings. So we work very intentionally in alignment. It's very intentional part of our mission to work in alignment with CAC so that we can continue to do two big things that are part of our mission. And those of you who have heard me speak before have heard this a thousand times. Assembly's mission is two big things, to expand the pie of resources for arts and culture sector throughout uh, greater Cleveland. So CAC plays a big role in that, but there, we wanna make sure that those funds stay strong and look at other ways of funding. The second part of our mission is to increase equity. We talk a lot about that. We wanna be a very intentional, intentional on how we expand the table, increasing equity for BIPOC organizations, for BIPOC uh, creative businesses, for BIPOC individual artists. By BIPOC, what do I mean? Um, black, indigenous people of color, uh, and also for other historically marginalized um, groups. That's very important to us as a society. It's very important to us as an organization. It's at the core of what we do. And between the both of us, if you look at the bottom of this chart on, of the screen, you'll see we have assemblies. That's what we are right now. These quarterly assemblies are meant to be a feedback loop so that we as a nonprofit can make sure we have the finger on the pulse of the needs and concerns of the overall arts and culture sector. A lot has been happening since we started back last June. So we're happy to be here to do this today. I did see in the registration, we have board members from Assembly, uh, Chan Fowler Spellman. I saw in the registration link. Um, there may be some other board members we wanna acknowledge their, their presence and thank them for serving uh, in that volunteer position on the board of assembly. And of course, we always like to acknowledge our partners in this work, Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. Let me just turn it over for a, a hello from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. Jill Paulson, sure. I believe Yes, I'm here. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see folks. I am here along with the rest of my teammates, India, Jake, Jania, Julia, I think we've got most folks here. Um, we've got a couple of announcements, but do you want us to wait maybe till you get through content? What would you prefer, Jeremy? Go for it. Okay, I'll keep my comments quick. 
Um, this is primarily, as you know, CAC's role is staying in our lane of serving and funding nonprofits while assembly funds the entire creative economy and supports them. Um, so my message is focused to those nonprofits who are either seeking funding or already getting CAC funding. And I'm trying to channel my teammates who are on this call. So Jake, Jania, Julia, India, if you um, hear anything and you need to pop in, please do so um, if I'm missing something. Number one, ARPA funds. Some folks have been confused in recent days. The county issued its own small, um, simple application from council. That is not the CAC application. That is individual council members approach to divvying up their dollars. And um, if you are interested in applying for those dollars, please contact your council person directly. Um, we've heard from council that it is best for you to have a connection with your council member. Don't submit something blindly. So um, there's that piece. And then just timing wise, and I know Jeremy will speak during his portion about just the timing of ARPA, but know that we'll be sending out some updates soon just to clarify for nonprofits. CAC will be uh, uh, subgranting that 1.65 million, but we're not yet approved, right? So we got to get through council approval. We still don't know when we're going to in front of council, but when we know, we will let you know. And with Jeremy and assembly, we'll um, make sure that we have a good audience in the crowd to demonstrate um, the commitment and interest uh, to funding the arts with ARPA dollars. So those are just two key things. If you had any questions about ARPA from CAC, contact our team. Again, we're telling folks this money is vitally important, but it is half what we received from the, from the CARES dollars. And so just as you're thinking and planning and doing your own work, no, these dollars will likely be, well, will be released in 2022, but they will likely be uh, half of what some folks saw last time around. If you wanna inform our process, come to the Arts and Culture Network Night. Julia, I'm looking to you, but um, we'll be hosting a info session at 6 p.m. next Thursday. Please come and participate in Arts and Culture Network, not like you always do. Anything else to add, Julia? No, I'll drop the registration link in the chat. Thank you, Jill. Yeah, and that'll be a way just for you to inform how we do our work, but we always know the best money is flexible and the best money comes quick. Um, and then third, our eligibility check. If you're getting a current operating support grant from CAC, don't worry, this isn't for you. You've got a midterm report coming up, but um, for those of you looking for uh, 2023 project support, 2023 cultural heritage, contact one of my teammates and um, make sure you get in by our eligibility check deadline, which is May 31st, super fast. And we wanna make sure you're in the queue to get uh, money for next year. So um, that's, that's our speed. Uh, conversation here. Again, my teammates are on, on this call or message us if you need anything or give us a, a call after. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, Valerie. Yep. Thank you, Jill. Thank you very much, Valerie, for doing that. I also want to acknowledge Leandra Richardson, who is here also on our team and uh, my right hand and making sure things are on point. Um, we're going to start with fiscal sponsorship. Uh, we are, uh, are growing our fiscal sponsorship program at Assembly, and uh, let's. Uh, I'm going to ask one of my web mem uh, team members to go to our web page of our fiscal sponsors, which shows the current fiscal sponsors. We have about 10 fiscal sponsors right now. We are aiming to double that by the end of the year. Why is that important? Um, fiscal sponsors are tend to be organizations or initiatives or sometimes projects that do not have 501c3 status. Oftentimes they may be grassroots or community-based arts and cultural initiatives connected to social impacts, social justice, um, neighborhood work. And we as a mission of assembly wanna make sure that we're providing tools to make those initiatives stronger. Um, and they can be strong without actually creating a whole number, of, uh, a whole, another 501c3. So very quickly, we wanted to say we have a push to encourage those initiatives or projects that do not have 501c3 status, uh, if they are interested to contact us, uh, both Valerie and Meg are working with myself to make sure that we can provide tools. So why would, it, why would anyone want to become a, a fiscal sponsor? Uh, you would want to become a fiscal or fiscal, fiscally sponsored project if you have funds that you are receiving from a foundation or individual or entity 
Many times there are legal rules that require those foundations or individual donors, they can only give to a 501c3. They can only write a check to a 501c3. They cannot write a check to your project, no matter how valid it is. So they can use us as that intermediary because we are a 501c3. I won't go into the details of this. We did a whole session on fiscal sponsorships and that session is available online. But yep. I do want to share that we are doubling that. Um, Valerie, you want to add anything more to that? Uh, just that it, uh, if you go to program section of our website and um, you go to request fiscal sponsorship, you can view the um, the webinar or the recording right here. I will say we're doing everything within our power to lower barriers to access, both for the fiscal sponsorship and other things that you're, we're going to be talking about today. We are constantly tweaking our website and updating it with information. And we will also be doing more webinars or we're adding webinars and Zooms as we're gonna be talking about shortly. As we come out of the pandemic, I will say that we will be doing also uh, community work that's in community. Uh, I, I, myself and my team and the folks we're working with wanna be there with those who may not have easy access to websites, broadband. We know that's a big challenge in, in Cuyahoga County that our government officials are doing all in their power to make sure broadband access is uh, more available. So we wanna work with people on both sides of the digital divide. Those of you who are savvy enough to be on the Zoom today and those who, who may not be on the Zoom today. Thanks for moving us on. Uh, a big part of what Assembly does to make the case to expand the pie and increase equity is we gather research. And I just wanna make you all aware of something that's coming up, that'll be coming up late summer and in the fall and the spring. The city of Cleveland, or I say we on behalf of the city of Cleveland and behalf of Greater Cleveland and, and, and the MSA, the Metropolitan Statistical Area, we are participating in a large study that happens every four or five years. Some 200 cities participate in this. The point of this study is to uh, gather information about the economic impact of arts and culture. Uh, one part of that, the survey is we literally go around to events and festivals and galleries and communities that are doing arts and culture. And we, uh, we query folks, how much did they spend to attend that event or to go to that concert or to, to be at that, that uh, music event? Um, how much are they spending for their ticket? Did they spend anything? Did they drive far? It's a very uh, a, a simple survey, but a very important survey. We will be gathering uh, probably close to a thousand surveys, 800 to a thousand surveys over the course of eight to 10 months. We will be reaching out to many of you who have events, who have nonprofits, who have both large and small nonprofits. Uh, we will be reaching out to uh, our for-profit cultural groups as well. Uh, this information is going to be generated and then sent to Washington, D.C. to a group called Americans for the Arts. They are the ones that are conducting the study. Uh, and then they will generate uh, this nationally comparative economic study. It's called Arts and Economic Prosperity 6. And that's a little bit cumbersome to say. AEP 6 is the shorthand for it. I just want to give you all a heads up. If you are a head of a, a, a major organization, uh, we will be working both with uh, volunteers and, and, and perhaps stipended support to make sure we have these surveys in hand. And the last thing I want to say about this is we want to make sure we, we go beyond the usual suspects. There is a national narrative and a national need for us to make sure we're tapping into not just the anchor institutions that we all know about, but also groups from uh, local neighborhoods, community groups, um, BIPOC serving and BIPOC led organizations. Yeah, I'm using that word BIPOC again. That is a special emphasis of this national study this time to make sure we have a fuller picture of how all of us are participating in the economic prosperity of the arts. So stay tuned for that information. When you see that email coming from us, please respond so that we can work with you and your teams to get these surveys out. And we're gonna put some incentives in there so there'll be some something fun or something valuable 
for your organization to receive as part of participating in this. So stay tuned for that. Anything more on that team members, I should say? All right, no. let's keep it moving. ARPA, you've heard already from Jill Paulson about uh, just some concerns and questions about ARPA dollars. It's coming into our community in different ways. Of course, ARPA stands for American Rescue Plan Act. These are federal dollars. Again, you all know this, federal dollars from Washington, D.C., meant to rescue and to help uh, our communities that have been negatively impacted by COVID. They're all in the headlines right now, both on the city level of City of Cleveland, as you know, the county level for the county of Cuyahoga, as you know, but also even on our state level, uh, as you know. So. I'm gonna ask us, um, Valerie, again, for our website, we do have, a, a, and you're gonna see, we're gonna keep coming to our website, assemblycle.org. We have actually a website about the ARPA Rescue Fund. And as Jill mentioned, we have received uh, a commitment, but not yet the vote, a commitment from uh, Cuyahoga County $3.3 million for arts and culture. Half of those dollars will be funneled through Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, and half of those dollars will be funneled through assembly. As soon as we have our, the vote happens, our paperwork is finalized with the county of Cuyahoga, we will be issuing uh, the call for applications. And I wanna say before we do that, we are speaking with, uh, on the part of assembly, we are speaking directly with individual artists and creative businesses to do what? To lower the barriers of access. Um, we are tweaking application processes that we did with the CARES, and we're doing it also in a way that we can be more intentional about reaching communities that have uh, been historically left out. Um, so we really wanna hear from you. So. Um, and a good question from Sean Watterson, what is happening at the state level with the ARPA funds for the arts? Yes, there is a current request of $50 million for ARPA dollars on the state level. And that is being uh, uh, advocated by a group called Ohio Citizens for the Arts. Assembly for the Arts with our partners at CAC, we are working with oh, oh, the Ohio uh, Citizens for the Arts and other arts councils across the state to advocate with our state legislators to put this $50 million back and to re reinvest that back into the hands of our local arts councils. I'm gonna ask Jill, if you wanna say any more about our work there, uh, I will be in Columbus next week uh, with legislators with uh, the Greater Cleveland, Partners, uh, Greater Cleveland Partnership, also to advocate that our legislators uh, pass approval of this $50 million request. And thank you, Valerie, for showing on our screen uh, information to access our lawmakers in Columbus. Um, so that is happening in terms of ARPA on the state level through Ohio Citizens for the Arts. And I do believe we might have a couple of OCA board members on the call, but if I could just make a plug, I think it's been a great evolution oh. of that organization becoming e even uh, a broader umbrella to Sean's point and um, and more effective. I know we've found them to be quite helpful in recent months as Jeremy and I try to work on a more statewide approach. So I know some of you already are members, but if you're not, take a look or make sure you stay connected to assembly so that they can kind of pass along that information. But I'd say, um, why don't we just check with Angela directly about how she's thinking about the 50 million. I think this is another case where we're just trying to get money first <laughs> and figure out um, some of it might be out of the control of the people advocating for it, of how it is distributed. And again, some other folks here might know more, but I'd say um, Angela would call. always be She's, more Angela yeah. Melica, who is the uh, executive director of Ohio Citizens for the Arts. She's actually in the room with us right now. So, Oh, awesome. Hey, Great. And we'll be going through some of the data too. So I don't want to jump ahead. So um, we're, we'll be going through some of the data that's yeah. that's released in just, a, in just a moment as well, Angela, as you... Um, provide an update. Great, and thank you for that. So I'm watching my screen, Valerie, I've got the website. Do we wanna to go to the next slide? Dozens of Cleveland artists showed up tonight at city council with one request for council to allocate $10 million of federal COVID relief funds to support art. 
Those artists want Cleveland leaders to know they need the money to bounce back from the economic impact of the pandemic. News 5's Jesse Schultz has their message. The artists had a pretty colorful way of delivering their message, dropping off postcards of their work that is already displayed throughout the city to show that our future is pretty bleak without them. From Cleveland's east side to the west side, you'll find no shortage of art. The arts are a huge part of our infrastructure here in Cleveland, and uh, they provide a lot of healing and support to people in our community. Enriching our thoroughfares and filling our theaters. Artists are um, a part of neighborhoods. But those painters, poets, and performers all came together Monday to tell city leaders they need help. People had to get rid of their studios. People had to get, people lost their houses. Lots of businesses didn't even open. So it really was crippling for a lot of our arts community. Jeremy Johnson is president of the nonprofit organization Assembly for the Arts. We're still in a state of emergency when it comes to our creative folks and our creative industries and creative businesses. The group is made up of hundreds of creatives in Cleveland and organize those artists to make and deliver postcards to city council. And we have art from literally 17 wards of the city. Johnson says they're asking for city council to allocate $10 million of the $511 million Cleveland got in American Rescue Plan Act funds. We are part of the solution. We're part of the, the return. We're part of the resurgence. Saying that money would go to creative nonprofits, individual artists, and businesses to keep them and the city's vibrancy afloat. If we get healed and if we can um, be more resilient with the support, then I think that we can help with the incredible work that's happening at City Hall. Mayor Bibb did suggest in his transition report that the $10 million of funds be allocated to the arts, but Johnson says a recommendation is not a commitment, and that's why they showed up today. City Council should decide where the funds go in the next few months. Reporting in Cleveland, Jesse Schultz, News 5. All right, Jesse, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Valerie. So an update, uh, the report, and I want to thank and Channel And that's available 5. on our website as well. Thank Channel 5 for that coverage. Of course, you can see by the attire I was wearing, that was back during the colder days. Um, so I just want to remind everyone that over the last eight months, we did sessions and assemblies and community events and various type of focus uh, groups where we asked the arts and culture community about our interaction with the city and what would be expected, uh, what were the priorities from the community for the city of Cleveland with the incoming new mayor. So we have recorded your recommendations uh, on in, in writing, and so you will find that on the website. Uh, the number one recommendation across the board was for the city to create an infrastructure in City Hall dedicated to the creative and cultural industries, including uh, naming a cabinet level position for the arts and culture. That was number one. Actually, number two, which is not here, was, was dedicating money from ARPA for arts and culture. So that, that was actually was number one, dedicating dollars from ARPA, and number two, creating an infrastructure in City Hall. Let me just do a quick update on the number one, the ARPA, since that, that uh, video was made with Channel 5. We are working still very closely with the mayor's administration um, on, uh, and especially city council. I, we are still meeting directly with all 17 city council members and uh, also with the mayor's administration to encourage them to move forward with the naming of a, a cabinet level position. On the ARPA side, we've been told that it may be several months. Uh, the mayor's team has come out with some more ways for the general community of Cleveland to come together and to, and to advise on how ARPA dollars will be spent. However, we did get our request in early last year. So we are rolling that in and continuing to advocate for that. On the real role of that office, I, we are in touch with the mayor's chief, uh, uh, chief uh, strategic officer who will be over uh, that office when it's created. And he, his name is Bradford Davey, has given us his commitment on behalf of the mayor that that will be moving forward in due time. I do not have a timeline for that, but I do know that it is moving forward and uh, we are looking at how can we provide information, resources, even other public and private support to make sure that the city can 
move forward with having this very important office in City Hall. All right, so let's keep it moving. If any, are there some questions in the chat? Let me see if any are relevant to what we've been going on. Thank you, Chen Fowler, great video. Angela is reaching out to Sean Watterson, Angela of Ohio Citizens for the Arts. Okay, let's keep it moving. Racial equity, of course, I've talked about the role of racial equity in our organization and in, in the work across the ecosystem. So let me mention several things that I'm asking my staff. Uh, please chime in in case I miss something or I need to be edited. Uh, a couple things we're doing, I already mentioned the expansion of the fiscally sponsored projects. Secondly, we're going to be creating, um, am I able to talk about the, uh, the special arts leadership? We public. are with that's not that's not public yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's not yet public. I can tell it have a big racial equity, racial equity lens to that. So that was a little sneak preview. Um, the other thing we we are working closely with a consultant called Equius. They've worked with other agencies across uh, Greater Cleveland and Cuyahoga County. They are our DEI consultant. DEI stands for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We're really thrilled to work with Alicia Merritt, I'm sorry, Alicia Love and Erica Merritt, who are the principals of that firm. Um, these are local, uh, locally connected and invested leaders and facilitators um, who are helping us to do a landscape overview of, of the diversity landscape in the arts and culture in Greater Cleveland and how we are working internally with our own board, with our own staff to address issues of racial equity and how we are empowering and making sure we're creating tables of power across the sector. And I'm really thrilled that this involves both our BIPOC-led, BIPOC-serving organizations as well as primarily white organizations as well. We are all part of this work. So I'm really happy for that. Valerie, what else should I be? Uh, bullet point should I touch on here? Um, we did want to note that um, here that we will, we're sponsoring the Great Lakes African American Writers Conference, and they just released a press release with the Cleveland Foundation that there was a big um, NEA grant for Cleveland Book Week, and um, the GLOSSY is the, is the acronym that, that will be um, a recipient of those funds to support um, African-American writers. They have their uh, keynote speaker. Um, and we also wanted to just provide space for anyone else to share the work that they're doing around racial equity if, if anyone was interested. Um, if we have time, I know we're going a little bit over, but um, it's up to you, Jeremy. Yes, thank you for that. We're, we want to amplify, a big part of the siblings to amplify messages around, around racial equity. Now we can continue, Valerie. There's gonna be a slew. This is something that cannot be contained in one Zoom session, obviously. So this is, this is what we live and breathe every day as an organization. And as an ecosystem, as an arts and culture ecosystem, there is a vision that I have that as we talk about what are the headlines around Greater Cleveland, obviously we are a great arts town. We, gonna, we are going to be that great equity town as well. That is what we're working in partnership with both our nonprofit, our for-profit, our government agencies, other organizations that are collectives. Uh, we're doing this hand in hand. How do we change the narrative for Cleveland? How do we make sure the arts and culture are part of changing that narrative? And many of you are already doing this, so I do not want to pretend like it's not happening, but can we amplify that more? We are an amplifier, uh, I think, Share with us via email, via website, uh, so we can amplify your work, so we can help the world to know what is happening that is so great about Cleveland being a place to attract, retain, and to grow our, our residents so that we are that great city of the arts and great city of culture. Let's keep it moving. One of the tools to becoming this uh, city of arts and, and city of equity is making sure we're providing the tools in education and professional development and some very specialized area that may be that pertains to both nonprofits, for profits, artists, creative businesses. So, with the help of Meg Matko, 
and others, uh, we have created what we're calling the workbench series. And Meg, I'm gonna be calling on you in a second because the workbench series, we actually do have this on our website as well. Um, the workbench series, I don't know if you wanna pull up the history of the website, uh, the history of the workbench series. These started in January with a session that was led by uh, folks from grant makers in the arts. And it was on, uh, uh, on fiscal management. It was a really powerful session, but it also blended in those issues of equity, racial equity serving uh, uh, disenfranchised uh, populations. So if we go to that website, you can see really the history of the workbench series. There you are. So we have a half a month of workbench series under our belt. We are now gonna be rolling out more. Those, those workbench series have focused on some particular areas. I mentioned the grant makers for the arts. One was specifically on accessibility. We were thrilled to do that with the Cuyahoga Board, Cuyahoga County Board of Development Disabilities. Um, we will be rescheduling the healthcare is not a privilege one. So look for the new dates for that. Um, that was start on March 10th. We need to reschedule that one. Fiscal sponsorship, as I already mentioned. Uh, just this, uh, this month, we did two in partnership with a group called SCORE, which are, which are really excellent uh, professionals and um, retired executives who are providing us with some tools for creatives, whether they're business basics or marketing basics. Uh, yesterday was one of them, and we have more coming up. I think one of the questions we have on the table and, uh, is what other topics can we provide to community? And these are all free, by the way. So I wanna thank our sponsors enabling us to make these free. Um, what are the topics that would be of use to assembly to both nonprofits, creative businesses and individuals? That's one of the things that we hope to uh, really tap into uh, even today that we, we may not have tapped into otherwise. I'm gonna to look to my team members or others to chime in here on the question and so, or, or fuller uh, explanation on workman series. Meg, did you wanna chime in? Sure, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit just about the sort of extension or evolution of this series um, in the coming months. Um, so we have been following a fairly traditional format with the Workbench series, um, a webinar style. Uh, we identify an expert to present a topic or information that either speaks to a practical resource, um, access to an opportunity or a way to tap into a specific network. Um, so we want that to go beyond um, just a basic professional development and be more than just a training session. So there is an expert identified who, could, who people can tap into much later on um, as a standing resource in the community. But we also recognize that there are hundreds of experts in the arts and culture community um, who maybe don't have the opportunity to present information. And we wanna provide that um, as a platform um, proposing a program called Workbench Community Core, uh, which will be topics identified by community members and presented by community members. So you will get access to the platform, the virtual platform, um, the Zoom uh, support from assembly promotion on our various communication channels, and then the opportunity to present your own workshop through that platform. Um, if this is in the proposal. If we can get funding for this program, um, in my ideal world, I would love to be able to provide a speaker fee to everyone who, um, every community member who presents through that platform. So um, that's just a little bit of an overview of a, of a new part of that program that we're working on. Um, it's a really about uh, looking at power sharing and kind of flipping that idea of who decides who the experts are. So. Um, thanks, Jeremy. I just wanted to leave it at that. If folks have comments or thoughts on that, that concept, please feel free. Thank you. Sure. I was saying what you're seeing on your screen right now, uh, Creative Industries Economic Contribution Report. This is late breaking data, late breaking news. So excited we are to be working with Ohio Citizens for the Arts and with uh, seven other 
seven other Ohio regional councils, as well as our partners at Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. Um, collectively, we commissioned a study from Bowling Green State University, which has a, a major center there focused on economic studies, economic contributions and impact. That these late breaking numbers really show a, a number of things. So I, we talk about how much economic impact the creative industries had before COVID, and that's been enormous. So for example, many of you saw that wonderful study that was in the press a, few, a couple weeks ago, the four largest arts institutions in Cleveland generate 800, generated $800 million in economic activity, economic impact prior to COVID. So that shows how, that's just one slice of the pie of how strong the industry is. This study on the other hand, really presents a more sobering view of what has happened since the pandemic. And why is this information important for us and why is it important for you? The, one of the key ways that we are getting our foot in the door of city lawmakers, county lawmakers, and state lawmakers, one way that we're getting our foot in the door and making a statement, please continue to invest and in create in artists and creatives and business and individual artists is by showing them this data. This data is directly linked to our ability to flow resources through to all 90 of you who are on this call. So it is a bit wonkish. I know it's a lot of data and, data and graphs, at least we're trying to simplify it for you all today. The studies themselves can be a bit wonkish, but this is critically important. So what, what does this data show? I'll sum it up for you. You already know this. And I said in that tape, the creative arts industry has been devastated by COVID and we are still being devastated as, as we're working through the pandemic. Our industry that you all represent was hurt far worse than any other industry in Ohio and in Cleveland. So without sounding like a teacher, I, thank you, here are the bullets. You don't, you don't have to memorize this. This is all, of, will be, is all available. The decreases in employment and economic output, the decrease was four times larger for arts and culture than the overall Ohio uh, industries. The decline in payroll in the creative industries was seven times larger compared to o Ohio's overall economy. So on every, every aspect, the payroll protection program, many of us participated in that, PPP, it did not provide adequate support to employees in the creative industries. Here's what I will ask of some of you as we're making these cases to our lawmakers. We need to back up the data with your own stories of your organizations or your own artistic practice, how you were impact, how you continue to be impacted by COVID. Have things gotten back to normal for you? Are they better than normal? Are they still, are you still, or are your constituents still struggling to get by? We love those qualitative stories to connect with the quantitative numbers. And I just put in the chat a link to more details on that study that we just shared um, about the Cleveland creative industry. Again, special thanks to Ohio Citizens for the Arts and, and CAC for helping us make it. So uh, now is a point of discussion. We do have a lot of people in this room, so we may not be able to get to every question, every discussion point, but we did want some thoughts and reactions. How are you doing so far this season with the pandemic continuing to pose health threats? And actually, you know, things are spiking up now. Uh, I, on our board meeting yesterday, one of our board members was saying some events that have been scheduled were now being adjusted. So there, we're in this constant state of flux. So let me step back and be quiet while we open the open our discussion for some back and forth. So do we have any first takers? Uh, I was speaking with one nonprofit executive uh, who talked about the impact, not just of the pandemic and health, but the impact of inflation on her nonprofit. She runs a nonprofit cultural organization. And even on um, the fact that her, her staff is now smaller because they've taken other jobs with other folks who can pay more and can provide more benefits. So her cultural group, which does incredible work, is holding on by, you know, really by their fingertips. 
because the pandemic, the, the impact of that and inflation continues, continues to have uh, you know, a harmful effect. And I'm reading, I'll read through this, uh, the chat. This is terrific. Thank you for sharing. Um, from Julie Riley, the true impact of the pandemic is just now hitting my organization at a time when support funding is gone and ARPA funds are glacially slow to come through. That's, that's point on. And Martin Cohn is, is, is talking about a presentation, why public health needs the arts. Um, Matt Weinkown, burnout and mental health, not to mention physical health is the biggest issue right now among staff. These are what we're hearing, staff burnout. Um, it's been two years we're going through this. We're hearing this across, across the board. And I would also say that we're also hearing from nonprofits with the uptick and, and, and the current situation with uh, the COVID variant, some folks are getting sick. They may not be hospital sick, but they're having to call out from work for time. And that is, that's also is affecting um, the ability of nonprofits, for-profits and others to, to, to work. Thanks for sharing those. Um, and I'm just gonna read another chat that's further up from uh, Dorcas Johnson at SCORE, which is an excellent business resource. He also mentions the Veterans Business Resource Council which we shall check into with a phone number. Thank you. So the message I'm hearing both from the chat and, and from what I've been hearing directly from folks is we are not out of the woods. Um, as I get out into the community with our team and our board members to see how arts and culture is, is functioning across the land, there is more activity, thankfully, um, but we are certainly not back to normal. And we're part of what we're trying to do, what we're doing with CAC is to provide those flexible dollars, which is harder with government dollars so that we can recover. So we can reinvest, you can reinvest in your gig work and your nonprofit work, what that, whether that needs to be to reemploy staff, to, re, to do pro, to get projects up and going, but those flexible dollars to get back in, into community, to invest in this very large, uh, billion dollar industry. Jill. If I could add to that, thanks, Jeremy. I know some of us have been talking about this idea of strong looking balance sheets. And so, um, and, and acknowledging that that is a kind of a mirage and the masking that, as Julie said, the, that some of the government funding has had over, over time. So I just wanted to let those of you know um, who are kind of looking at your balance sheets and saying, but if funders look at them and they might see that we're doing okay, I think we're trying to, at least on our end, push the narrative much more clearly like, yeah, right. Um, look a little further, know that these groups are uh, delicate already to start at times, some of them, and that um, to, to look beyond just the bottom line because that's a short-term moment in time. So as you have more stories, the more you can tell us, I think the better we can advocate on your behalf to our other, to our peers as well, because um, if people are just looking at numbers, they don't always see the reality. And, and so wanted to, to make note of that idea of like strong looking balance sheets versus the reality of what you're living every day. Thank you for that. Um, we've talked a lot about the nonprofit side of things. Um, I may want to put, uh, our for-profit partners on, uh, just to talk a little bit about that. Um, the music industry group in Cleveland has been very prominent and, um, and our, our venues have been very prominent in really raising the flag about how they have been devastated by the pandemic. Um, I'm real, I, saw, I think I saw Sean Waterson's in, in the attendance, I don't know if he's still here, but there is a conference coming up of the National Independent Venues Association Neva will have their conference here in Cleveland uh, in, the next, in the next several weeks, looking at how the industry has been impacted, especially the for-profit venue industry uh, has been affected. So we're really happy that Cleveland is, is going to be an outlier in, in raising the banner of even how those for-profits have been affected and, and their ability to, to stay afloat. So I just wanted to give a call out. Sean, yeah. can you say anything? about, yeah, about what you're seeing and, and, and you're part of the industry. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, yes, we are, Cleveland is gonna be the host city for the first ever NEVA conference. 
Um, Neve is the group that led the Save Our Stages effort that brought um, $50 million to arts organizations and businesses in the city of Cleveland and 140 million to organizations across Northeast Ohio. I think 78 million to organizations in Cuyahoga County. So uh, very happy that we are the host. Um, that same weekend, the American League of Historical Theaters is having their conference in Cleveland. So they will be over at Playhouse Square while we're at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, they were involved and big beneficiaries of that Save Our Stages effort as well. Um, one comment that I uh, thought about putting in the, in the chat, um, to the extent that I'm all for the economic impact studies and especially the impact of COVID on the arts, to the extent that that research includes losses experienced by small businesses and losses experienced by individual artists, and that research is used to advocate for funding. Um, I would hope as a sector that we would, we would advocate that funds go to all three if we are gonna use the pain of, of the entirety of the sector to advocate for funds. Um, I would hope that, uh, that the entirety of the sector uh, sees the benefit of those relief funds. And I do know the county funds, um, there is an increase in the amount going to small businesses and individuals percentage wise from the CARES Act. Um, we're very interested in seeing what happens at, at the city and at the state. So um, that's my update. Thanks, Thanks John. Absolutely. Looking at um, small businesses and individuals, we are keeping an eye out. Maybe, Sean, you can help us on uh, a number of small business programs that both the county and others are coming out that they are not quote unquote arts and culture programs but they are targeting small businesses and we want to make sure that our creative sector is is keeping an eye on that and that we're tapping all possible uh, sources of support i know i believe the county and possibly the city don't quote me we need to dive deep on this and i'll dive we'll be diving deep with you sean and others in the small business sector after all, our creatives are often entrepreneurs in their own right. And we need to make sure we, we look at all pots of money and not leave any stone not turned for this. Yeah, I believe the county approved 2 million for all small businesses across all sectors. Um, not clear yet uh, what the application process for those funds looks like. And I'm not sure what's happening at the city level. I do know at the state level last year, um, some, uh, especially venues, were able to get funding through uh, through the Small Business CARES Act funding. Um, the last time I checked with the state, there was no uh, plan to continue funding small businesses with ARPA dollars, but that may have changed. Thank you for that update on, on that. So we will keep posted and we'll also be updating our website. I'm gonna just go back to the chat, a few updates. Uh, thank you, Martin Cohen for indicating uh, Jill Sankey of the University of Florida Center for Arts and Medicine presenting uh, for Metro Health upcoming on June, 10th, on June 6th. And there is a link in the chat. Um, and a, a comment from Karen P, Karen Prasser, at Chagrin Arts, uh, who talked about, again, this, the COVID uptick. Uh, she was about to go back to board meetings. Uh, three board members uh, have come down with COVID. So they're in a state of flux as regarding their concerts. So this is real time, folks. Um, I appreciate you all sticking with this uh, and making sure that you know, we can navigate these uh, turbulent times. I'm gonna go back to staff, Valerie, for our next points for the remainder. You're and you're muted. I see. Thank you. Um, if uh, 
the one thing I wanted to know, and something that we talk about internally sometimes is, is the balance when you're, when you're working, when you're struggling to keep staff, when you're struggling to figure out whether you're in person or, or virtual is maintaining that level of racial equity work that was happening before there was a real strong desire for that work before the pandemic hit and really maintaining that balance of mission driving, racial equity, the hurt from the pandemic, both in ticket sales and funding and all of those things. Um, staff, staff health, I know we've had a few staff members out. I don't know if any Anybody has thoughts about that? I just want to open it. I know this is, this, there's not a lot of time, but if anybody has just un, to unmute yourself, just to really share how you're balancing all these items. All I can say is, you know, as we're struggling and really trying to stabilize and, you know, hoping for a future when we can get back to what we were before, we're totally committed to our work towards equity and diversity. And it's, it's already built into all of our thinking and planning and hoping for the future. Thank you, Julie. I think that that's really good to hear. Um, and I can say that um, a, a number of collectives are looking at how we're all responding. I think uh, later this week, there's gonna be a press announcement or maybe it's later today from uh, a collective of funders in Greater Cleveland who had focused on COVID impact, and they did a survey of nonprofits across the board, arts nonprofits, and uh, many other uh, social service nonprofits. Um, in fact, uh, and they, this study will show uh, the impact of COVID uh, across the whole nonprofit world. I'm going to find that link and we'll be able to share it with all of you. I think it's going to be important uh, to what Julie was saying, how we're all struggling to, to stay in this work. But this is going to be an important study because we're hearing it from um, the the foundations and the philanthrop philanthropic world of Greater Cleveland, what they've heard from the nonprofit world. Um, I, I oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, go ahead, Veronica. Oh, I was just going to say that I think that there's a large effort being made to try to create balance of some sort of racial equity. But if there is also there the forgotten nonprofits, the smaller nonprofits that have barely stayed afloat and their balance sheets are not even gonna look close to good for anybody to get give funding and feel good about it. But there have been some that have been able to collaborate with other organization. And from my experience and what I've seen working with smaller nonprofits that don't have the access, don't have the resources, don't have the team. And it's mostly because their funding is low. It's not because they don't have the program because a lot of them at some points, they go in their own pockets. And even though they shouldn't, they do to keep it going because they have people that actually depend on those programs and depend on them to be there, whether it be for their emotional, mental or social you know, support system. And I don't think sometimes that things are looked at in that way because those nonprofits could be used on a on a bigger scale if they're just given the support. And many of them don't even know that these resources exist because there's not enough marketing done to that market to reach them. Thank you for that. That's I think that's part of the, the charge to assembly and our partners to make sure we're tapping into not just our, our name brand and well-known nonprofits, but those that are doing the work, but are, are you know, do not have the resources to get, to, and didn't even, even before the pandemic, we're really struggling to, to get those resources. So I'd love to reconnect with you, Veronica, offline, so we can make sure that we're, we're touching and informing and, and amplifying their work and seeing how we could channel um, supports. So we're right at time. Um, one last uh, reminder about Arts and Culture Network Night next week, um, 6 to 8 p.m. 
Um, we'll also be, uh, there's a lot of work on our end, just sort of in the background, kind of maintaining relationships with public officials, doing our work um, internally on racial equity, as well as developing programs um, for groups. Uh, and we just hope you stay in touch with us. You can sign up for email newsletters, to modify your preferences if you wanna get those workbox emails that are um, resources to your inbox. Um, we're gonna start segmenting that out so that we're not flooding people's inboxes too far uh, or too much. So um, keep an eye on that. And um, that's all the updates, I think, as far as next action steps. Um, and Jeremy, I'll let you send us out. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Meg. Thank you, Leandra and, uh, and Absentia Kristen Hutch, our researcher. And thank you to our, our supporters and thank you all to your partners. Thanks for taking the time. I know it's, it's a lot to spend an hour in an assembly with a, a very general agenda, but this is very useful to us to advocate for you. Um, look for more reports from us and from Ohio citizens from the arts, Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, uh, the city of Cleveland, the county of Cuyahoga, our big umbrella groups that we're working with to advocate for, again, those two big things, expanding the pie of resources and increasing the equity. Thank you all and have a great day. Be safe out there.